I think the big shift is, going, is that we need to be delivering much better digital employee experiences. episode of Open Up Digitals with James Robertson from Sydney, Australia. The way in which we work is changing rapidly because of digitalization of our workspace and because of all these new technologies and of course because of the corona this change has rapidly accelerated. So how should companies deal with all these new challenges? How can we as employees stay in touch and stay involved and how can we do things differently or even better? I talk about this today with James Robertson from Sydney, Australia. He's author of three best-selling intranet books in the whole world and a thought leader on the digital workspace. Welcome, James. Good, good morning. Good evening. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, people talk about the future of uh, work and about the changes in, in the way that we work. And until recently, this was mainly about uh, the digital uh, changes that we see in our workspace. Now, certainly, Corona has had a large influence on that. What things do you see that have gotten into gear through Corona? Uh, look, I think there's the obvious thing to say, which is that um, you know, the Corona situation has shown that, that all of the things that we've all been talking about for a while really can work um, and actually maybe need to work in, in much better than we had uh, have had in the past. And I think it's shown both that, that some things are really easy, but it's also shown that some things are really hard. I mean, the easy thing is, well, people can work from home and, and, and they can be productive um, in an environment other than the office. And, you know, digital tools and, and collaboration tools and productivity tools, well, they work. Uh, so, you know, and, and I think, Everyone has had a, a, a very open spirit to the situation, knowing that we all just have to make it work. And so everyone has, you know, um, organisations and employees have all just pulled together to say, look, let's just do what's necessary uh, so that we can be productive uh, in these difficult environments. And, and that's proved to be, in many instances, rather easy. However, it's also shown that some things are really hard, which is uh, that... Uh, obviously, you know, the, the Zoom fatigue uh, is real. I mean, the science shows that, you know, it's the lags in the communication, uh, the underlying technology, which makes it really hard to know when should you reply to someone uh, and how do you participate in a two-way conversation. That makes our brains work harder. Uh, and there's science, including the brain scans done by Microsoft. Um, but it's also shown that, that things like culture, uh, is hard and that maybe when we are all separate then how do we have a common sense of the organization that we work for how do we manage those interpersonal relationships and how do we manage all of those micro interactions which we've taken for granted that we have about chatting to someone in the lift on the way to lunch uh, or leaning over to the person next to you and asking a question how do we actually do that digitally uh, and even harder, well, it's one thing to say what's culture in this new environment for existing staff, but if we're, we're going to be bringing on new staff, right? I mean, organisations will get through this. They will rehire probably faster than the corona situation will change. So how do these new starters have work? I mean, they're going to come into an organisation. How do they understand the organisation? How do they join the culture when they've never left their living room? And I think there's some really hard questions that, that IT people uh, and HR people really need to think about this. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's indeed, it's, it, it, it accelerated everything and it showed us that it is possible, but it also is showing some difficulties now, indeed. Uh, how can people uh, stay connected, indeed? Um, but um, if you look at the corona, when, it, when it's finished with medicine or whatever, how much of this change will stay? Will we long back for the office or will we try to find a way to do it more digital? 
Look, I think it, that the, the universal consensus is that we're not going back to the way it was um, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, firstly, well, actually people quite like working from home rather than being on a crowded train for an hour or two every day. And there are some challenges about you know, looking after kids and dealing with barking dogs and stuff like this and having a, a, a productive working environment that's not the corner of your bedroom. Um, but it's clear that people like this. Uh, and so I don't think there's gonna be a mad rush back into offices. Um, Organisations have also realised that maybe they don't need to pay for quite as much real estate as they did. And so maybe it's actually quite a lot cheaper if not everyone comes back. Um, but I also think that, that there's going to be a recognition that there needs to be greater resilience in organisations. Uh, and we didn't have that before. We had this very fragile idea that organisations only worked when everyone was sitting next to each other in an office. And yes, some people were flexible working or activity-based working, but they were the minority. And where there's very rigid ideas about how organisations worked and all that's been blown apart. And I think it has shown for, from an organisational strategy perspective uh, that, well, there needs to be greater resilience and that resilience is gonna come from better support for all ways of working. Yeah. And in fact, in many instances, deliberately choosing not to congregate large groups of people together because that's actually riskier. Okay. Uh, and you're seeing new announcements now. Atlassian has just come out uh, today um, and said, we're gonna let anyone work anywhere. And that we see that as a strategic change so that we can accelerate our shift towards uh, hiring the best talent regardless of where they're located. Yeah. Um, so I do think there, there's going to be some personal drivers. I think there's going to be some organisational drivers. And yes, some things are going to go back to the way they were before, but a lot of things won't. Yeah. yeah Which is great, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of plus in that, but um, also a lot of extra concerns because you already mentioned your organisation has to change a little bit. Now, you're a world-renowned thought leader and expert in the field of internet platforms and digital workplaces. Now, if you look at the future principles of these platforms uh, on the design and the functionality of uh, intranets, uh, does Corona have an influence on that? And, and, and do we see changes? And are there different needs for these platforms, especially now that we work from the home? Yeah, look, <clears throat> what, um, what I'm talking about now as the, as the strategic view is, is the digital employee experience, so DEX, which says, okay, <clears throat> the human in the picture who is sitting in front of the screen. Well, actually, how does this all fit together for them? And that's proved to be one of the hard things. You know, in the past, like we've, for a long time, there's been remote workers in organisations, but they've had horrible VPNs or ghastly security or really slow connections or systems that just don't talk to each other. Yes, you can get the internet on your phone, but you can't apply for leave. Uh, and so, if we're talking about this new environment in which we're working, then actually I think the big shift is, going, is that we need to be delivering much better digital employee experiences, recognising that, that if we look at, say, customer experience, which everyone understands and sees as important, well, first off, maybe we should therefore think about employee experience, and certainly folks in HR and, and others are already, but the reality that I think is only just being recognised now is that you can't deliver a better customer experience than your employee experience. And so I think there's, there is widespread pressure to say that, yes, we need to deliver better, more functional environments, but we need to deliver better stitched together experiences that are, the, and we talk about um, you know, some guiding principles for digital employee experience. And one of them is, we'll deliver simplicity. Okay. So simplicity. Which is simplicity. simple to say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, Turns out we've, yeah, well, we've not been very good at it, right? Yeah. Because, you know, go into SAP or Oracle or PeopleSoft or any of these systems and they're horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So that's an important thing. But I think, 
Yeah, but I think also there's some guiding principles that says uh, we should strive for equity of experience. So that is to say, we should be delivering the same fundamental digital experience to all of our employees. Yeah. And that's going to drive technology decisions because up to this point, you know, the internet did this, you know, and that was largely desktop based only. Um, you know, we've then got collaboration tools, which, you know, worked in different ways and different platforms. You know, there's a growing selection of, 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 um, you know, sort of frontline experience tools, frontline communication tools, which is great because it highlights that we have not been supporting them all that well up to this point. But if we are talking about equity of experience, then actually I think we need to be saying, no, six different solutions for six different staff groups to do the same basic thing is not the way. And that we should be thinking more holistically so that we can say, for example, we know this communication message reaches all staff in a timely way, in a rich and engaging way, and in a way that they can well, comment on or reply to and interact with. And we should be 100% confident of that across every staff person, regardless of whether they're in a factory or in an office or out in the field or in a hospital. And so it, that's one of the goals to have that consistent experience. Then I do think that that puts a good amount of pressure on vendors to say, well, we should probably integrate better because we're not, it's not going to be one technology to rule them all. Um, but I do think it means that, for example, we need to provide an enterprise front door, um, which is from an experience perspective, but then in practical terms, there should be one jumping off point that staff can use to get to everywhere, but also to know that they've got visibility across what's happening in all of these different systems. Um, and that's been a big gap. We've had internet homepages for a while now, but they've been fairly limited in functionality. Um, tools like Office 365, well, they don't have a homepage, which is kind of odd. You know, here's the 24 different applications in the waffle, but you know, knock yourself out. So, you know, at the moment we are delivering complexity to, 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 to our staff. Functionality, for sure, but complexity, the opposite of simplicity. Yeah. Uh, so suddenly I think businesses should be putting pressure on the vendors. And I think the vendors themselves recognise that, that there's much more work to be done on the experience, not just the capabilities of the platforms. Okay. So you, you, I, I try to, to um, um, make compact. What you're saying is that the, the, the technology should be, should be working. It should be accessible for everybody. It should be more yes. easy, more client friendly, etc. Uh, but then you're at the point that you 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 uh, have your platforms and tools bought from the shelf from from the yep. shelf, and then how do you ensure that indeed your employee does actively involve get involved in the platform, participates, uh, contributes, etc. Yeah, so look, technology uh, that should be flawless, but yeah, yeah. Look, obviously you don't want you know usability barriers in systems uh, that reduce um, adoption. Um, Look, I talk about ensuring that we take a purpose-driven approach. Um, so not just here are all the tools, you work out what might be useful for you, which look, you know, 20%, 30% will make great use of the tools. Um, but probably the rest of, of the employee population well, is busy doing their job. Um, and so I think the onus is on us and on business leaders um, to really be clear of what is the purpose that they're trying to achieve. So, for example, um, if we look at, at nurses in a hospital, uh, well, you know, they're rushing around looking after patients. So, well, what are we trying to achieve here exactly? Um, but if we look at it, there are clear purposes. So, they need to coordinate themselves as a team, uh, you know, including things like rostering, but also around... Um, you know, so, uh, mutual support. Um, they also need to be doing really simple tasks in terms of applying, leave, uh, applying for leave and also learning stuff. And so if we go to that with that purpose, 
that helps us to do two things. It helps us to shape the technologies that are provided, even if they're out of the box. Doesn't mean we, we give every feature to every staff member. So maybe we pick the six features that are most useful. Not customising, but just picking which things to turn on for who. So we shape what is provided, but then we engage with employees uh, and work with them to say, look, if this is our purpose, how do we achieve that? And then that brings in all of the human aspects, more than just adoption and training, because I think that's a very limited view of things, much more around, you know, what is the support? What is the ongoing dynamic that everyone wants so that staff get what they need and organisations also get what they need? And that's that purpose-driven approach rather than a technology-driven approach, which is, I think, what we've started to fall back into, unfortunately. Clear. Well, um, do you have one final advice for our viewers, which step they should take first now? Because I know there are, there are a lot of companies mm. working on the intranet and a digital workspace and they're, they're busy with that and they see the importance of it, but they also yeah. find it hard to combine the, the, the user experience of the employee with that of the customer and how they connect yes. that. And, and so they see the need for an intranet, but still find it hard to start. Do you have a, uh, an advice for them where they should start first? Yeah, I think there's two things, two really clear things to, to, to my mind. First off, start by spending time with staff. And it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but actually a lot of teams don't get much chance uh, to get away from their desks uh, and to spend time with the actual users. And I don't mean, you know, doing a survey, um, you know, or I mean going off and actually spending time in their environment. Uh, and that does two things. First off, you learn a lot in just a day or two. And all I'm talking about is a couple of days. Now you learn heaps. It will also um, generate greater passion amongst us because we will remember why we're doing this because we've just spent time with the staff who need the help. And so by spending time with staff, just a handful of days, that immediately, I guarantee you, will identify one or two things that could be done straight away that would make a big difference. Which then brings me to the second point. Do the right small thing. So trying to solve everything, you know, boiling the ocean, as they say in English, um, is impossible, right? We've tried to fix everything and it's not our job. It's above our pay grade to try and fix all organisational problems. So do the right small thing. The right small thing does two things. It, it, it helps. It helps actual employees. And delivers value. But the other thing is it demonstrates the value of the work. So you can say, look, we've done this. Look how great this is and the employees are really happy. And if we've picked the right thing, we can then say, well, look, if you like that, actually there's this slightly bigger thing we can do now. Uh, and by picking the right things, you build momentum um, because you know, lots and lots and lots of little low-hanging fruit doesn't get us anywhere. We're trying to solve everything in the one hit. Well, we've tried, right? And in any case, in this environment, there is not $5 million floating around to do this. There's not. Um, so the right small thing meets real needs now, but heads you in the right direction and builds up momentum. And that's what, I guess, we've, what I've realised from 20 years of, of consulting um, is that it's about picking the right thing. And that's where you want to really give some good thought to. But you'll know. You'll know when you've spent time with staff. Guarantee you. And if not, come back, drop me an email and tell me I'm wrong, but I'm not going to be. I think that's amazing. So spend time and do the right small things. I think that are very two very good points of advice here at the end of this interview. Thank you very much for your advice and for your time and for your thoughts. James Robertson from Sydney, Australia. Thank you very much. Lovely, my pleasure.